For more about China's space missions and plans, we're joined by former rocket scientist Keith Cowing. He's the editor of NASAWatch.com. That's a website provi providing aerospace information and commentary. Keith, uh, welcome to the show. The, the race to explore Mars is getting crowded. Who's doing what now? Well, Rowie, it is getting crowded. And that's the fun part about this, because um, there are, it used to, used to be only one country going to do these things. Now there's multiple countries. And as with any competition, peaceful competition, uh, the more people, the more nations, the more ideas that are involved, the more you learn. So uh, the more the merrier. China will be analyzing and mapping the Martian surface and geology. It's uh, looking for water ice and studying the climate and surface environment. That's according to the Chinese National Space Agency. How much of this remains sort of sovereign knowledge and how much of this is shared with the general scientific community? Uh, you know, sovereign knowledge is something that, you know, maybe that means let's double check it before we tell everybody. Uh, usually information about the planets is, is uh, the most fleeting of uh, not secrets, but uh, kept from people's eyes. It, it gets out and that's one of the nice things about, again, international cooperation here. It's scientific, it's purely peaceful. And uh, each nation provides another piece to a larger puzzle. And, uh, you know, if anything, like I said before, the more people that are asking more questions, the more answers we get, the more we know. So China's name of Zhurong meant to obviously get the population involved as part of a, of a, it was a short list. This name was decided for the annual uh, space day. How important is it that the population uh, is involved in something like this? It's, it's been important in other countries in the past uh, in their space race, I imagine. Well, I'm, I'm 65. I'm a child of the Apollo era, and I grew up just buoyed by the notion of, of America going to the moon. And when we did it, uh, it was something that I had lived my entire childhood through, and it indeed it affected my career. And now it's not just the U.S. and the former Soviet Union. It's many countries have this capability. So uh, it used to be one or two countries who were excited. Now the entire world is excited, and that's a good thing. What's next for China and for Mars exploration in general? Well, you know, this is the first time that China will be landing something on the, the surface of Mars, and hopefully it'll go well. And if they follow the path that they followed on the moon, they will follow uh, this, this orbiter and lander and rover with something more complex. And again, the, the notion is trying to understand Mars as a world that may have had life, may still have life. And, uh, you know, um, you, you need very sophisticated robots to, the, to do that. Eventually, though, we're going to send people, and you want to make sure you know everything about the place before you go there. In the U.S., often there is a political tug of war with everything, including uh, space, including the politics involved in uh, funding uh, and exploration. Uh, what sort of commitment have we seen from China uh, to be part of the space race, and specifically to Mars? Well, as you, there is a tug of war, and uh, while, while it's difficult for the U.S. and China to directly cooperate, uh, if you read the newspapers, the U.S. and Russia have their dis our disagreements, yet we've had 20 years of very cooperative and uh, productive uh, research on the International Space Station. So uh, the politics are often fleeting, and there's a larger picture here that, in the end, the, uh, the peaceful cooperation and, and utilization of space always seems to be the end result. So I, I think it'll all work itself out. And if you have one or two different programs pursuing their own avenues of research, all the better. Keith Cowing, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your insight.